Hello, and thank you for watching this video. Uh, if you would take your Bible out and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and we'll read uh, verses 1 through 8 from Luke 16 in just a moment. Uh, I want to say I appreciate you for watching this video. It's always good to be interested in spiritual things, and we want to spend just a few minutes talking about some spiritual things, and hopefully we can apply them to our lives. You know, we talk a, a lot of times uh, about Satan, and we talk about how Satan is the adversary, and he is uh, out to get us and to tempt us and to cause us to do evil and turn away from God. Um, he is, there's a place that's been prepared for him, uh, the devil and his angels, his followers, and that, of course, is hell. And so we talk about Satan in a negative light, correctly so. We should. Uh, but the idea for our lesson here is we want to talk about working as hard as Satan. Satan works hard, and we want to spend just a few minutes talking about working as hard as Satan does. Let's begin, though, by reading in Luke chapter 16 at verse 1. It says that he said also unto his disciples, Jesus speaking, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write four score. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Okay, so, parable of an unjust steward. Now, what did the unjust steward do? Well, he was uh, stealing or wasting his master's money for a while before he was told to leave. Uh, in that respect, he is like the religious leaders who were stealing their master, or, or stealing from their master before they were told the kingdom will be taken away from them. Uh, so, the unjust steward, like religious leaders, wasting their master's resources. Our Lord said of them that they were robbers of uh, widows' houses. How was the unjust steward wiser than the religious leaders? Well, when he was told that there was a time for judgment to come uh, and that he was going to be dismissed from his master, he started looking ahead to secure his future. Uh, and so uh, the religious leaders, though, uh, when they were told that judgment is now uh, was coming now, that they'll be cast out of the kingdom, they didn't look ahead uh, to make friends of the widows they robbed. And when John came preaching righteousness, they did not repent of the things that they had done uh, like the others did, like tax collectors and like harlots. Uh, so uh, this unrighteous steward was wasting his master's money, but when he was confronted with judgment, he made a change and he started looking forward to change things and make sure his future was secured. And so as strange as this parable may seem, it speaks an undeniable truth. Uh, the foresight and the determination of the adversary should inform Christians. And so like, uh, like this steward's looking forward to the future, we want to talk about our adversary, uh, the devil. And we want to talk about how he has a very good, very strong work ethic. Now the devil is not good, but his work ethic is strong. And we want to talk about what we can learn from that. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, the first thing we want to say is that the adversary, the devil, he knows how to prepare. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul said, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, we always talk about this, and I think rightfully so, from the perspective Paul is saying, Get ready. You need to put on the whole armor of God. Uh, and, and that's all laid out for us, what the, what the armor of God is, what the different pieces represent. Uh, and so we need to prepare to go up against the devil. But from the perspective we're looking at it right now, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil are there because he's prepared. Uh, the devil is prepared to attack those that are Christians, those that are following God. Uh, 
He's, he's led most of the world astray. He's got those in his back pocket. He's coming for you. He is coming for me. And the devil is prepared. And so our, our lesson, again, we're talking about working as hard as Satan works. He is working hard. He is doing his homework. He is preparing. There are many wiles that he has available to him in order to deceive and to trick. And we need to prepare uh, for the work that's set before us. What kind of preparation do we make for reaching those that are lost? We had a lesson uh, last Sunday morning about going fishing for men. And one of the points we made was preparation. Are we prepared to go and teach those? Notice here in Ephesians 6 and verse 15, uh, Paul said, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, are we prepared to go out and teach and reach the lost? Now, we're going to have to defend off the attacks of Satan, but we've got to be prepared uh, in order to go and do that. What kind of preparations have you made for the judgment to come? We need to be prepared because we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and so, the, the adversary, the devil knows how to prepare. We need to learn that we need to be prepared. You know, the second thing that the adversary knows is how to perform. Satan doesn't stop with the planning phase. He performs his plans. He follows through. Now, what about you? Do your plans, do my plans find uh, their expression in performance? I mean, do we just come up with ideas and then never do them? We just leave them in the planning idea stage? Or do we actually perform? Do we follow through on our plans? That's what we ought to be doing. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you'll turn there, in 2 Corinthians 8, I want to read verses 10 and 11. Uh, Paul said, And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Uh, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. Uh, you know, without, without looking at the, the greater context, the, the issue is, is that you come up with a plan, you set out to do it, and you do it. You don't just leave it in the planning phase. You get busy. You get to work. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 1, it says, For as touching the ministry to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. Uh, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain on this behalf. That, as I said, ye may be ready, lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not, ye, should be ashamed of this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would, up, would go before you uh, and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Uh, so, uh, again, there was commendation from Paul about those here who were being ready to perform. They didn't just come up with a plan. They followed through. They acted. They worked out their plan. So the devil knows how to prepare. He knows how to perform. He knows how to follow through on his plans. And we see the results of that in our world today. The devil has come up with many schemes and he has acted those schemes out, leading many astray. What we want to take away from is we need to prepare. We need to work to be prepared to live the Christian life, to teach those that are lost. We need to perform it. Once knowing what to do, then we need to go out there and do it. You know, the third thing the adversary knows is how to persist. Satan doesn't give up after being defeated. You know, many times we do something and we give up. We, we go try to talk to somebody about being a Christian. They turn us down. They refuse. And we just totally give up. I'm not talking to anybody else. I'm done. Satan doesn't give up. He is persistent. Uh, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll look at verses 8 and 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, familiar verse to us, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So, uh, here we're told the devil, he's your adversary. He's walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Could you imagine a hungry lion being standing outside the building uh, when you're ready to leave here? When I'm ready to leave here, there's a roaring lion, and that lion's hungry. That lion hasn't eaten. 
he's going to persist. He's going to come after me. And he's not just going to, you know, if, if um, I walk out there and I'm able to get away from him for one second, that lion's not going to say, or, you know, or think or act, oh, well, he got away. I'm done. No, he's going to keep pursuing me because he's hungry. He's on the attack. He's on the prowl. Now, that's the way that Satan is. He is not going to give up after being defeated one time. He is persistent. Do we give up sometimes too soon? I think we probably do. In, in Luke chapter 11, in Luke chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 5, uh, Jesus said, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine is in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give, a, and give him as many as he needeth. And then Jesus goes on to talk about asking, seeking, knocking, being persistent. Uh, you're not going to give the option to turn me down. It doesn't mean you be rude. It doesn't mean you, you, know, you force somebody to listen to you. But you're persistent. They're eventually going to give in and listen to you. But we give up too soon sometimes. We try to talk to somebody about the gospel. They don't want to hear it. And then we just we give up on them. We never go back to them. Uh, and so there is a point in time. There's another principle where you are to shake the feet off the, uh, shake the dust off your feet and move on. Don't cast your pearls before swine. I certainly agree with that. But I'm saying too many times we get just a little bit of negative response and then we totally give up. Uh, and we ought to be persistent. Satan is persistent. He works hard at that. Uh, we ought to be persistent in how we conduct ourselves. You know, the fourth thing that the adversary knows is how to persuade. In spite of knowing the consequences of sin, how can the devil still convince humankind to sin? Isn't that amazing? Uh, th there are so many people, now there's so many people that don't even believe in God and aren't worried about the consequences of sin, but there are many who believe in God uh, believe and know the consequences of sin and yet the devil can still get them to, to sin and he can persuade them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 3, Paul said, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that come and preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have <clears throat> not accepted, you might well bear with him. So, uh, what Paul was saying was, you know, the, the, just as Eve, uh, the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, he's crafty, he, he, he persuaded her, Paul said, I'm worried that somebody's going to come and preach another Jesus or another gospel and you're going to bear with them. You know, you've got to sort of accept them. Um, and we need to be, obviously, on guard against that. We ought not to let people persuade us in that way, in that negative sense. Uh, but we must be persuasive with the gospel message without being deceitful. So, so you get that, right? We want to persuade people. Uh, Paul even said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Uh, so there is an element of us being persuasive when we teach people. But obviously... We don't lie to them. We're not lying to get people to become Christians. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, it says uh, what I just referenced. Uh, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also that also are made manifest in your consciences. Paul said, knowing that judgment is coming, we persuade men. We tell men, judgment is coming. You need to get your life right with God. And so we ought to be persuasive. We're not lying. We're not saying something that is untrue. That's what Satan does. He tempts you to think, oh, this is just so great. You need to do it. You, you can't help but do this thing that's wrong. And he persuades you in that negative sense. We need to persuade in the positive sense where we tell people, you know, judgment is coming. And so you need to get your life right with God. We ought to compel uh, people to know they're standing with God. So, it, it maybe seems counterintuitive. Maybe that's not the way we typically think. Uh, but we need to be more like Satan in these matters. We need to be more like Satan as far as how he works, his work ethic. 
And we can use these qualities of him, of the adversary, for noble purposes. So, so we don't want to be like Satan. He, he is at odds with God. But we want to have some characteristics that he has and how he works. Because we can do really good things for the Lord if we work the way that Satan works. So, four things we mentioned. Uh, we said the adversary knows how to prepare. The adversary knows how to perform. The adversary knows how to persist. And the adversary knows how to persuade. So those four things. We need, to, we need to learn those things. We need to work like the devil works for good. He works for bad. We need to work for good with the same kind of effort that he works with. All right. So just a short lesson. Hopefully that was beneficial to you. Uh, we need to be working for the Lord. We need to be strong. Be strong. Stand in the faith and work for him. Uh, it's going to be worth it all. Because we'll get to go to heaven after this life is over. Now I need to ask you a question. Are you bound for heaven after this life is over? Of course, if you haven't obeyed the plan of salvation, then you're not on the path to heaven. You're lost in your sins. Um, and we don't say that to be mean. We don't say that to, to, to put you down and make you feel bad. Although you ought to feel uh, guilty for your sins. Because listen, all have sinned. And we want to persuade you to take care of that sin problem. Have you done that? You know, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world. The plan of salvation was put into place in the Bible. You need to believe the Word of God. And you need to hear the Word and believe it. You need to have uh, faith enough to be willing to confess Christ as uh, the Son of God. You need to be willing to repent of your sins, to turn around from how you're living, turn away from the world, turn to God. And then you need to be willing to be baptized for the remission of sins. Are you willing to do that? If you'd like to study that, if you want to talk through that with us, we'd be glad to help you out in any way that we can. If you would like to be baptized into Christ, if you'll let us know that. Uh, we'll be glad to assist you in any way that we can. You know, also, if you're a member of the Lord's Church and you are, you're an Aryan Christian, you've fallen away, and you need the prayers of the group here, we'd be willing to help you out in that regard as well. So, if you have a need, let us know. Especially, we're meeting in the building now. We, we weren't meeting for uh, uh, in the building for a while. We did a drive-in service in the parking lot and transmitted and people stayed in their cars. We transmitted over an FM transmitter. We're in the building now. We're meeting every Sunday morning at 1030. We're just having a worship service. We're not, we're not doing Bible classes. We are having a worship service. And we are following social distancing protocols. Um, we're spacing out. We have hand sanitizer. We have masks. Um, we're leaving in single file ways, family by family. Listen, we'd love to have you here with us. We'd love for you to come worship with us. And if you'd like to talk to us more about becoming a Christian or what we're about here at the Land Church of Christ, absolutely, feel free to come worship with us and let us know. Thank you for watching this lesson. God bless you.